uh, good evening and welcome. Uh, I want to introduce to you our uh, evening speaker, uh, John Campbell. John Campbell uh, is a member of the local ranching uh, Campbell family, just on the racetrack road. He's also a esteemed um, researcher uh, and conservationist, uh, and I can say that now because if some of you may not have heard, John is a 2015 Bighorn Award winner. Uh, to tell you a little bit about this award and how important it is to receive this award as an Albertan, the government of Alberta established the Order of the Bighorn in 1982 to recognize the outstanding voluntary contributions to fish and wildlife and habitat conservation made by private individuals, organizations, and uh, corporations. Members of the Order of the Bighorn have enriched the lives of all Albertans through their outstanding contributions to the conservation of Alberta's world-renowned fish and wildlife resources. Uh, tonight's presentation we're, will be about John's uh, lifetime work and, and also referencing to the work of his family and his father in uh, Raptor or Birds of Prey. Uh, to tell you a little bit more about John, uh, John has been working with birds of prey, especially prairie falcons and falcons, for more than 40 years. He began his lifelong journey as a falconer raptor uh, conservation as an 11-year-old serving falcons for the Canadian Wildlife Service with his father. John Campbell Sr. Um, uh, is responsible for many of the peregrine falcons in, in southern Alberta and also in Canada and has traveled um, Oh, and has traced successfully the captive breeding programs. John helped his dad and on the family ranch uh, in this research and the recovery of peregrines. John continues to actively survey monitor raptors areas and breeding sites in central and southern regions of Alberta. His knowledge and information and skills in raptor research are sought after by professional biologists in Alberta and beyond. In addition to John's work and research on raptors, he has mo motivated others to take action. He's also founded, along with many friends and supporters, the Alberta Raptor Preservation Society. The society supports volunteer efforts towards raptor conservation and plays a key role in informing and educa educating people about birds of prey. There are no signs that John is slowing down in any of his raptor work and he continues to monitor their health and breeding success and takes numerous actions all to the benefit of Alberta's Falcons. So, John, welcome this evening, and I'll turn the rest of the evening over to you. Thank you very much, Wendy, and thank you all for coming, and thank you also the uh, other libraries. Uh, do appreciate you coming. Uh, Wendy said uh, they've got a bigger venue here, and she said, John, the pressure's on you to fill the place up. Well, I've done that, but I think the real pressure is on me now is to make it worth your while, and hopefully I'll do that. This is the Order of the Bighorn Award here. Um, I'm really um, very honored and actually quite touched to have been considered uh, for that award, let alone actually getting it. And in that regard, I thank you very much, Wendy, because she thought I was a worthwhile to come and do this speaker series and also to nominate me, and I think it's probably because she did such a great job that I actually got the award. Um, I accepted actually on behalf of both my father and me, given that I have taken over from the work that he did, and uh, we always thought he didn't get the recognition he should have, so it's really both of our awards. Anyway, I'll get uh, into the presentation and uh, move the slide on a little bit. As I say, um, this is a, an overview of what I hope to be talking about. So Dad's background and my background, uh, some of the things that we do, serving and banding, we've done that, captive breeding that Dad did. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of the ecology and, and current conditions, what we have here in southern Alberta. And I'm going to make some comments about development and how that affects uh, raptors and generally. And then I'm hoping to throw in a little bit there, uh, kind of food for thought, something to make you think about. So we'll see. This is an interesting uh, slide here. 
and I'm going to call this my, my Joan slide and hi to Joan in Pincher Creek there. I was talking uh, about the presentation and uh, said to her, Wendy wants me to talk about the history in the background, but I don't think I want to talk about the birds. And Joan said, but you have to, John. You have to establish your credibility. And actually, Wendy put this together, so I was thinking of you, Joan. So I, this just tells a little bit. You can read it the same as I do about uh, some of the things that Wendy actually pulled out from the presentation that I uh, put together. It's over 50 years of uh, research and studies. Um, that might be a little bit of a stretch. And same with Wendy. I, I'm, I just have had a lot of experience with the birds. I wouldn't call myself a great researcher or anything like that. I just know the birds, same as I've got quite a bit of work uh, with cattle. And so I know cattle and how they behave. Same thing, just hands-on experience. Somewhere around 13,000 birds that Dad and I have banded uh, going through the, the books and what we've got, which is for raptors uh, quite a bit. If you're doing waterfowl, that's not such a big deal, but raptors don't produce that many. And uh, some of the more the newer things that we're doing, we're trapping and putting satellite transmitters on them, and that is telling us an awful lot that we didn't know. And we're still learning. And this is my father, and I'm going to talk a little bit about falconry here because comment I heard uh, Kevin Van Tegen, who was the uh, I think he was a park, park superintendent Banff, and he was in Waterton as well, and giving a, a discussion a, a presentation on conservation, and he happened to mention that he was a hunter, and he had this young couple came up and they said we really liked your presentation, but how can you honestly uh, come in. There's a seat here, Wendy. How can you honestly come in and call yourself a conservationist when you're a hunter? In actual fact, um, peregrines are quite interesting. They are the second most documented bird in the world, second only to the domestic chicken. And it has all been done, or nearly all of it, had been done by falconers. And the reintroduction, captive breeding, everything like that was all done by falconers because they're people that use the resource. And as such, they appreciate it. Gone are the days where, you know, a buffalo and we could keep shooting him and it didn't matter. Now people realize that. And even world renowned. Um, ornithologists like Dr. Tom Cade, who spearheaded all the captive breeding and the release work in the states, uh, head of ornithology for uh, Cornell University, is himself a falconer. So falconers were important. A lot of people like Dad. Falconers were concerned about the peregrines disappearing, and they were disappearing because of DDT and the effect it had. So they contributed their own birds, their own time, their own money quite often, and expertise to do that. So I wanted to, to make that point. And there's another, those are kind of typical ones. And my father, he, I do the same thing. I've had the same thing, we put our hands behind our back. It's a trait that I've picked up, and that's very typical of him. And this is one of his birds that he's put up in the air. And there's oh, a couple of years ago, it's me on the right, <laughs> when I had more hair and it was a little different color. And there's my father roughly about the same time. Those trees are the ones that are up the, the road by our place there for you, those of you who are locally. They're a little bit bigger now, so that gives you an idea what it was like. And that was one of the first, the first peregrine that I had. And these are some early pictures. Uh, one of the things that uh, Dad did do was there was always um, a research or a, a conservation element, I guess I'd say. So Richard Fife is the person on the right there looking down, and Dad's the one with the boat. And Richard Fife is a Canadian well or was a Canadian wildlife uh, service. He's still around, but just retired biologist and he came out west and dad helped him out finding birds and going out and surveying and they used to go down the Saskatchewan, South Saskatchewan River through Suffield every year to do that and that was always part of it and this one here is recognition by the Alberta Falconry Association on um, they gave him a special plaque he and the two founders the other one being Mike Person and um, I'm skipping through a little bit um, when Dad started in falconry, what happened, I guess I should say, he started in uh, Scotland and England, 
getting birds there. He corresponded with a couple of very well known, even now, though they're long gone, falconers uh, known internationally. And they kind of took him under his wing. And that was before the war. And the war hit. And of course, falconry uh, went out the window there. And especially in Europe, it was pretty rough. Although he was asked to fly peregrines after homing pigeons that the spies, the German spies, were sending over to Europe. And what I can't figure is how the heck did the spies ever get the pigeons in the first place? If you think about it, because they're pretty well locked off. But he didn't do that. He did have a goshawk in Germany and then came back. And then he came over to Canada, um, went to the University of Guelph and met my mother at uh, the same time, got a degree in agriculture. And I'm going to come back to that because I think it's important. And um, Falconry wasn't part of what he was doing. Came out here, found the place and bought it, and of course started a family and started his business into farming, and then we went into ranching. And what happened out uh, just west of here, there was a, a scub, uh, or cub uh, scout camp, and they found a goshawk nest, and one of the parents there was a lionsman, had spurs, uh, like whatever, wherever they are. You know, climbing spurs, climbed the tree, a couple of young goshawks, and they kept them over overnight, and that was quite interesting. And then, oh, now what are we going to do? And somehow they'd heard that Dad was a falconer, and that was my start and his restart in falconry over here. And hopefully you can hear a little better now that the air conditioner or whatever it was is kicked off. And um, so Dad started corresponding who else was doing it, and corresponded with people like Richard Fife, who you saw there. Um, and it was just natural to start looking for the birds. So we would go to that, where are they nesting? And we were particularly interested in falcons. We started looking for peregrine falcons and didn't really find any at one time, I think in 67, I think we went all the way up to Yellowknife. And that was really disheartening when you get into wilderness areas where there really aren't much of anything, and there's just no birds. And so then he found out about um, the Yukon would allow you to take peregrines legally. So he went up there in, uh, what was it, 66 or 67? Can't remember now. He went from Dawson City down the Yukon into Alaska and then back up the Porcupine River that was um, somewhere just under 2,500 kilometers and back, well, round trip, or round trip there and back. And um, <clears> they <throat> say there was always a scientific element to that. And one, a very famous, a very well-known falconer, and also a very well-known uh, biologist, Jim Anderson, went on that trip. Jim had been, con was concerned about the peregrines disappearing. He wanted to see what a healthy population was. And they were trapping adult male peregrines and taking fat samples off of their back, if they could get enough off of them, uh, to see what they were like, how much DDT that they had in their systems. And for those of you who don't know, what DDT does is it builds up in the system and it takes calcium out. It's a toxic compound. It, it's uh, what they use for insecticides during the war. They actually used to take uh, soldiers and spray them down. So, but it's just amazing. And it, it's long lasting, lasts for about 15 to 20 years. It accumulates in the birds, it'll actually poison and kill them, but it really affects the females and their ability to lay eggs and to have um, calcium. So you get eggs laid with just a membrane and no calcium on them. And I actually, uh, I went up a couple years, I think in 69 in, by the Old Crow, which there was nothing up there, just a winter road, northern Yukon, and I collected an egg there and they put it through the lab three times because they couldn't believe, and there's nothing up there. I mean, it's, it's wilderness. They couldn't believe that the bird that laid that egg could even be alive, let alone lay the egg. It was that toxic. Um, so it, there's always been a research um, part of it and a survey part, so Dad always made sure that he um, passed on the information um, originally to the Canadian Wildlife Service and did that. So this is an interesting one. This is a manuscript I found about a year and a half ago. I was visiting relatives in Scotland and they said, oh, we've got something of your father's. Do you know what it is? 
And this is trip down the Blackstone and Peel Rivers. And uh, they drove up from Black Diamond all the way up to Dawson City. And then they went on this. It's the only river that goes west to east. It had never, parts of the Peel had been floated, but not the Blackstone and not the combination. It had never been done, and it's really quite interesting. Dad organized the whole thing, figured kayaks would be the best thing, but never actually got in a kayak until he got to Dawson City. <laughs> and it's all in the book there. So, uh, um, And these are the various pictures of, of going through. Um, there, Pictures were still there, so there's the kayak, and I think my brother Andrew still has this kayak here. Uh, we still got it, and that's what they went through and did. The Mounties didn't want to let them go, actually. They said, uh, no, we won't let you go. And they said, well, you can't stop us. And they said, fine, give us your name and next to kin, and we'll wait two weeks and let them know. Because there's no GPSs, there's no satellite phones. You went out there, you were out, and you showed up at the other end, or you didn't. And then the Mountie finally said, okay, if you're going to, make sure, I think he said, either make it 50 or 100 miles down, because then you're not in my territory, and your next of kin won't bug me. <laughs> so, and he actually did, there's a couple of times, he got caught by a sweeper, and he got torn off, uh, thrown in with waders. Almost killed him. It's, it's, I'm, I'm getting it printed up now. There'll be some copies at the library here, so it, it's interesting reading. This is what it's uh, like. Uh, there's the middle one is what it's like with the mosquitoes and that. You're going to see one a little bit further on with me with lots of hair, and actually that was something that uh, is really worthwhile because it does keep the bugs off of me. And this is some of the canyons you've got. Now the Pig barn and the $10 fine and everything, which I'd actually forgotten about till Wendy um, brought it up. Um, what happened is Dad, um, when the peregrines were disappearing, he knew about this with people like Jim Anderson. And uh, he and Wayne Nelson and I, I think um, Richard Fife went down to a conference that they had in, I think it was 69 or 70, late 69. Anyway, uh, you get that. And uh, coming back, which is what a lot of falconers did, Dad said, you know, I've been thinking about it, and these birds are just too valuable to fly. I've got to put them up and try and breed them. And he did that and put them in. And what happened back then um, with fish and wildlife, they had a research branch and they had a, an enforcement branch. And let's just say that the two didn't get along very well. And the research branch was supporting dad and we even were getting pheasants from the hatchery at Brooks and it happened that local game warden who wasn't a bad guy and said phoned dad up and said I hear you've got some falcons and dad said uh, yeah I do you want to come up and see them so he said sure and that was the same year and again um, you know it's all kind of almost incestuous everybody knows each other Richard Fife had been studying prairie falcons and they found mercury um, poisoning on upland game was too toxic to allow for hunting season. That's the only time I think they've never had a hunting season. And so the game warden came up and he looks at you, oh, pheasant, where'd you get these? <laughs> we got them from a hatchery at Brooks. So I gather it went through um, <laughs> the department and there were, imagine, some interesting discussions. And so I think research kind of won out on that and said, well, look, you know, the peregrines are disappearing. We know that. We have no expertise. We're not looking at it, thinking about it. Here's a guy that's donated his own birds. He's got the expertise. He's got the facilities. We really don't want to slap him for doing that. Because, uh, and, you know, originally when we first got the birds, nobody thought about permits for anything. If you want a magpie or a crow or, you know, a lot of people have a deer or a coyote pup or something did it wasn't a big deal I think if you went and fish and wildlife and asked for a permit they went for but you know then it got on a little bit more so anyway uh, I went through the organization they said well um, this is a good deal for us because he'll do it all but we've got so they decide ten dollar fine and um, they'd confiscate the birds and then give them right back and they Originally, they didn't. When the first game warden came by, they didn't. I think they did take them for a few days. Game back said, but they're not yours. They're the crowns now, but we breed them. And they did provide some funding for materials, but he never worked for them, which is not a bad position to be in because then you can really argue and say, no, I'm doing it this way. Um, you don't have to fight the government as much. Um, 
So these are pictures. Dad was the first to breed peregrines, one of the first in the world, um, first in Canada, we believe. Um, the other one was Cornell University. Um, and that's kind of interesting. They beat him the same year, which from nature's perspective is the same thing, really, because it's whether you produce this year or not. It's not how early you're. That's a little bit of oversimplification. So dad did it. It's a pair of birds. The male was actually my bird. And this is the setup that we had uh, with them in there. And they were really quite interesting. This one is a, a good one of dad's female. Um, it's a good thing she's small because you can kind of think female grizzly on steroids. <laughs> she was not afraid of people. And she's over my dead body and I grab her, move her out of the way, and you reach for the young and she's right there again. And we finally had to put a trap door in. And Dad, as I said, he continued to work with Richard Fife, help out with CWS just uh, going on. And I really like that picture. That's one of Richard's. I have no idea what Dad's doing, but it shows him. Um, to me, the, the love of the birds comes out, um, the comfort he has in, in holding them. He's got a female in his right hand and then the male he's holding up there. And I don't, as I say, I don't even know where that is or what he was doing uh, with them, but obviously something and uh, that's what he looked like in his younger days. Uh, maybe doing something with Richard, they used to go out and have a great time together. Um, when dad was breeding, and I'm going to go back to his ag degree, um, you think about breeding these birds and you think, well, gee, really, shouldn't you have biologists doing it? And if you think about it, not really. Um, it's not that biologists are bad, don't get me wrong, but biologists are only trained to observe. They're not trained to raise things. And I know there's a number of people with agricultural backgrounds here who can appreciate that. Dad had a degree in agriculture and knew a little bit about incubation. One of the things that he was very strong on also was nutrition, which biologists don't have a clue about. And I'm going to get back to that. And uh, the other thing that he was is natural breeding. And one of the problems that they had, and Dad always used to say with the falconers, because he said they love their birds too much. They're always going in and checking on them. They can't stay the hell out of the pens. And it, you think about it. Um, Imagine, wouldn't it kind of cramp your style if somebody was coming, hey, how are you guys doing? You getting it on yet? <laughs> you know, and dad, so dad would put the birds in and, and leave them be. So natural breeding, and he was known for that. He and uh, Wayne Nelson, who was a then a doctoral student in biology at UC, did a hour-long video and presented at the um, Raptor Foundation, I think, uh, well, the conference down there, most people except for Cornell University have no idea. And it's a complete right from start to end of the breeding season and the behavior and did that because dad was very big. It's, we've got to get this information out and do that. And universities aren't necessarily, especially if there's academics involved, aren't necessarily quite so willing to do that, whereas dad put it out and he was very big on that. So the agricultural background, I think, was important. Um, from his perspective. And the interesting thing I'll say, too, um, is that some people seem to think that we are much better than nature, that not only can we beat nature, we can equal nature, we can beat it. And I'll tell you, with breeding birds, we can't. We can't beat them with nutrition and feeding the birds. Um, one of the things that we found here is known as something called rickets. And if you get a young bird, an adult bird, it doesn't matter. And a good that gets to new uh, nutrition is if you just feed them soft, soft parts of, of a bird, which they normally eat, their bones, particularly the leg bones, don't have enough calcium. And they'll actually bow like this or even break. And the birds, it'll kill the birds. You have to do that. And so dad was big on, did a lot of research on uh, vitamins and supplements used to supplement both the adult birds and he knew what the importance was of feeding um, because if you're going to raise um, if you want cattle you want them to cycle you want them to get pregnant you want them to have healthy young and raise it you got to give them you got to feed them properly and some of these guys were used to feeding adults chicken heads which are boiled and washed and 
they have no nutrients in them. That's terrible. You can't expect them to breed if you're not going to give them the nutrition. And he was very strong on that. And the other thing that he did is work with incubation. And well, to get back to actually the nutrition part, when we look at the adult birds and when they're feeding their young, they look like they're feeding the soft parts. They, they'll eat feathers, they'll take the guts and they'll eat that. They don't look like they're giving them bones. So they look like they're doing exactly what we do, but their young are always healthy. And we can't do that. And this is an interesting one with incubation. Um, these birds are not like chickens. They will lay into the mid-teens, maybe high teens sometimes. The odd bird will go into the low 20s in terms of eggs, but the last half a dozen or so eggs are not viable. You'll eat, they'll, get, they'll be much smaller, sometimes without even a shell on them, the last egg or two. So you can't do that. They're not viable, so you want to maximize your production. And we cannot duplicate incubation the way they do. We can't particularly duplicate the first five to seven days. They lay a clutch until recently of four eggs. The first two they lay and they don't touch them. And then on the third egg, they start to incubate. And what they start to develop is what you can see here is these brood patches. And, by the, and the eggs are laid two days apart. And they have to develop, and whatever that gradual process is, we can't begin to duplicate it. We kill, still can't have, if you put eggs under an adult bird, you know, switch species or whatever, they're going to hatch more than what we can in an incubator. They just do a better job. And in terms of uh, hatching is really interesting. What we found is that they lose about 17% of their weight. So when an egg's laid, you go and measure it. You graph, it's quite simple. And you know, day 12, it should weigh this. If it's too heavy, you dry it out, get that weight down. If it's too light, you put more, increase the humidity. You might even wipe it off with a cloth or spray it if you have to.